Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our lecture this evening. Uh, happy New Year to you all, and welcome everyone uh, logging on uh, online as well. Our lecture uh, this evening is on confined spaces designed for maintenance. We're delighted to welcome Simon Lyons from Cork City Council. Uh, Simon has worked for 15 years in the engineering industry uh, in Ireland and in the Middle East, gaining experience on a broad variety of projects from wet and dry utilities, infrastructure planning, design and delivery for master plan city projects to groundwater and water balance studies. So he's currently responsible for the operation and drainage and upgrade of the city's uh, sewage system. He's particular focus on mitigating hazards, embodying resilience, ensuring constructability, and considering maintenance requirements throughout the lifetime of the assets as part of the design. So I just ask you before we start, just to turn your phones to silent. Uh, if you haven't already done so, I know the, the exits are just behind us and to the side. And uh, just like to welcome uh, Simon. Please, thanks very much. No, thanks very much, Alan. Um, so, as Alan said, I'm Simon Lyons, head of Park, uh, wastewater operations in Cork City. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about design for maintenance. Now, you can see Sam up there. Sam was meant to join the talk today, but uh, unfortunately and ironically, he's stuck in something he can't get out of. So, we'll. Uh, We'll carry on without them. I'll go through Sam's bits anyway, <clears throat> and um, I'll try and cover them um, as best as I can. Um, there'll be a case study, so um, which was carried out by Sam and his guys, and we'll kind of use that case study really to set the kind of basis for what we're going to talk about then, which is kind of avoiding those kind of hazards, kind of at design, and but also you can avoid them at our stage where we can kind of do retrofits or, or uplifts. So the the kind of the running order of the presentation, I suppose, we'll start with the intro. We'll do a little bit of the boring stuff first, which is just a couple of wordy slides just to set the scene. There isn't too much words in the presentation, but I think it's important. We'll redefine what the confined space is, and we'll just get a good idea of, uh, of the hazards that we're looking at when we deal with these things. Um, we'll go into Sam's case study, <coughs> um, and we'll just talk through that a little bit. And then what we'll do is we'll use that case study to ask the question, how could we have done things better? Could we do things better? Um, taking it through, understanding your role in design. Um, and also then we've kind of tried to set out a few design considerations, which you can see just here. Broadly trying to follow the principles of prevention in that kind of that kind of descending order of preference. Um, so, and then hopefully there'll be a bit of time for a discussion. Yeah. So, as I said, we'll just do the boring bit first, but just to read, um, I suppose, reiterate for anyone who's not fully familiar with the definition from the regs, a confined space is any place which by virtue of its enclosed nature creates conditions which give rise to a likelihood of accident, harm or injury of such a nature as to require emergency action due to the presence of or reasonably foreseeable presence of flammable or explosive liquids, harmful gas, fume, vapour, free-flowing solid or an increasing level of liquid, excess of oxygen, excessively high temperature or a lack of oxygen. So again, a bit wordy, but important just to highlight that there's a few hazards in there, very serious hazards in there, and that's as defined in the regs, the 2001 confined space and the 2013 construction regs. <clears throat> also, it's worth noting that there's a few key characteristics of a confined space. The risk, the space is substantially enclosed. There's a risk of at least one of these hazards arising, and there's a risk of serious injury aggravated by the enclosed nature of the space. And so, it's not okay, but it's not as bad to break your leg outside a confined space as it is inside. And then the potential injury is such, is serious and is such to require emergency action to rescue the person involved. So again, there's that rescue element, how do you retrieve someone in a confined space? I won't go through this slide, it's just up there to, I suppose, highlight that the definition in the regs isn't exhaustive. It doesn't, you don't take that box and then, you know, you're, you're, you, you move on. There's a place of work hazards, there's slippery floors, there's moving parts, there's work activities, are you creating noise, dust, electricity, mechanical equipment, and then there's industry specific hazards. Now this presentation is very much focused on the water industry. We're going to use the examples from water wa waste water operations, but hopefully the kind of the thought process that's prevailing is applicable to the other industries. Um, and you can see there in our local authority sector, obviously contact with sewage, microorganisms, infection. Um, and don't forget again, then there's third party hazards. Are you entering a space where the equipment hasn't been isolated? 
are you entering a space where there's inadvertent operation of plant? Um, have you turned off the pumps? But does the caretaker know that? And is he going to come and turn them back on? <clears throat> and are there nearby work activities? Or are there members of the public either going to create a risk to you or a risk to themselves? So again, really just highlighting the fact that when there's confined space involved, there's a huge number of hazards which need to be considered. Um, and what we're trying to ask is all these to be considered or at least thought of during the design process to feed into how that space is going to exist when what you've put on paper turns into reality. So what we have here is we have Sam and his guys in Dynarod have done They've responded to a call. Um, there's, there's water coming out of the mandal. People don't know the source of the water. There's no clear drawings. Um, and so basically Sam and his guys have been called to figure out where it's coming from, what's causing it, how to resolve it now. Um, I might stop and start this a little bit, so apologies if it's a bit annoying, but it's a bit hard to read, so. Yeah. Okay. So this is basically the arrangement. What it is, is there is uh, an existing pump shaft and someone has decided they want to build a building on top of where that is. So instead of moving it or relocating it or maintaining access within the new building, they've decided there's going to build a floor slab over it, install an access tunnel and then a new access shaft to that tunnel. Now, none of those things seem ideal, but Sam and his team have been called in to assess it and to try and figure out what's going on. So I'll just, I'll just let it run for a little bit longer. So you can see here, this is the arrangement which, once they've, once they've really figured out what's going on, this is what the entrant has been asked to do. So you can see this is the new building, this is the old shaft which used to have access but now doesn't, and this is a retrofit. Now that's, that's not, and also what, what Sam's been called to do is that this whole thing is holding a level of water. They have some information about it, but it doesn't necessarily match with what they're seeing on the ground. So again, that's just showing that the drawings that are not particularly clear. So again, they kind of get to work, they start their risk assessment, they start considering the hazards. Um, and again, what is that liquid? Is it rainwater, sewage, something more sinister, is there a chemical element? Um, and again, the drawings are inconclusive. They're not very clear as to what's going on. So again, this is just asking themselves the questions. And so you can see they, now that they've done their homework, they're ready to do an entry to kind of investigate a bit more. You can see quite a large team assembly that is carrying out this work. And this is the first look at the space. And you can hear people are in full BA, they're not taking any chances with the, the quality of the air in this space. And again, that's the access tunnel. What you have here now is an entrance doing cleaning before they do a full inspection. And again, you have two entrances, so you have two people at risk in this space. Uh, So I'll just pause it there for a second. You can see that there's a few pieces of equipment here. Now, considering that there's no access to this except down the shaft, across the tunnel, and in through a, a, a kind of a retrofitted doorway, there's a few big pieces of equipment which are going to be very hard to pull out of that pipework arrangement if they need. If that valve needs replacing, if this white piece needs replacing, if this VJ needs replacing, it's going to be very hard to take those out using only manual labour, and it's going to be very hard to get anything but manual labour in there. So. The questions are starting to arise, was this really thought about or was someone just trying to maintain access after the fact? Um, and again, you'll see here in a moment, uh, that's the old access. 
So an obvious thing would have been to maintain access. And then this is just other identified, unidentified. Is that a cable? Is that a wire? Is it live? Um, I probably went over there. Anyway, there's Oh yeah, just there. So you can see there's a sump pump down there. There's probably a 150, 200 kilogram pump down there, which again, how is that going to get out if, if that needs work? So Sam's asking the question, could this have been designed more safely? No, we're not, we're not going to labor on this, present, this, um, this design. We're not going to tear it apart in case the designer's here. But the answer to his question is almost certainly yes, it could have. So what we're going to use the asking of that question, we're going to try and answer how we could have maybe designed that more safely. We're, we're going to use that to kind of start the, the conversation. So the first one that we're going to say is, you can understand your role in the design and in terms of how that influences the safety of other people. Other people are going to interact with what you design, but have had no control over the, the form, the shape it's going to take. So you can see right here, designers, PSDP, huge influence Huge ability to influence safety. Operatives, right down here, the guys, the people who are going to be stuck maintaining this, entering the shaft, crossing the tunnel, cleaning the existing shaft, no opportunity to influence it. And again, just the other kind of big uh, complementary pyramid which shows site operatives are the ones affected by these safety considerations. So really, I suppose, what's the note I have here? Operatives in the industry will react effectively to what's put in front of them. Um, it's up to the designers, the PSDP, even at the kind of the construction stage when there's a DBO, to, to influence that, to make changes, to highlight hazards, um, and to try and do things better. So that's understanding your role, understanding what you do impacts, that has an impact. Obviously there's guidance, we have 2001 confined space regs, which we mentioned already, we have 2013. Uh, construction regs, we have the Health and Safety Code of Practice is a good document, but we have knowledge and experience. We have the industry, we probably have the industry in this room. If you don't know, if you're not sure, if you need guidance, ask the industry. Um, the knowledge is out there. And then also, we have the general principles of prevention set out in the 2005 Act. So these are there. They are descending order of pref preferential ways to mitigate hazards and risks. I'm not going to go through them here because you can see the next few slides go through them. And what we've tried to do in the next few slides is just highlight a few or suggest an example. Again, it's, it's wastewater industry focused, but hopefully the, the thought process is applicable. Is to suggest um, examples of how we can apply that particular principle, say for a pump station or, or for a confined space in the wastewater industry. So the first one. Avoid the risk, obviously, just get rid of the confined space. Do we need the pump station? Do we need two pump stations or could we have one? Certainly in Sam's example, we don't need an access shaft and a tunnel and another shaft. Like we, we have at least two out of three things there which could be mitigated out by just moving that access shaft. So we could avoid the risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can we, if, if the risks are unavoidable, we have to evaluate them identify them, understand them, risk assess them, and then mitigate them. Combat risks at source, again, we have that opportunity, and you can see I'm trying to show how we're descending down the pyramid here. We're still at this point where, it's, you know, combat risks at source, change the design, um, if you can, obviously. But again, we're still in a, you know, a good part of the pyramid here, but now we're starting to move down, adapt work to the individual. So again, the confined space, we have to have it. Okay, let's maximize the works that can be done from the surface. Let's minimize the number of entries, let's maximize work, and let's figure out ways to do that. Um, adapt the place of work to technical progress. We can upgrade the space, even after the fact. Even us in operations, we can upgrade the, the space, some new technology. There's a better jet track, there's a better way of access, there's a better way of maintaining the space. Let's upgrade it. Let's put better covers in so that we can get uh, I don't know, an entrant and a man basket down in big space um, and not have to use ladders, platforms, etc. Um, there's an example here I've mentioned, which is Mahan North, which we kind of focus on towards the very end of the, the presentation. Mahan North gets a bit of a bad, a bad going in this presentation, but there are plans in place to fix it, improve it, upgrade it, adapt the place of work, um, and also to replace 
dangerous systems of work by less dangerous systems. Again, I've kind of alluded to it previously, but we can see Sentry using ladders. We can cut that system of work out and we can find a new way to do it. Um, again, with equipment that is taking an entry to service it, we can retrofit guide rails, we can put lifting chains and we can pull it up to the surface. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about that kind of equipment as well later on. We can use collective measures or protective Collective protective measures over individual measures. Again, uh, this isn't an exhaustive list. This is the way to do it. These are just examples of kind of a, to provoke the thought across whatever industry you're having this conversation in. One way on a pump station or a confined space that we're dealing with, we can specify good protective um, fall protection systems over the openings, over the covers. Otherwise, we have an open hole and we're relying on individuals putting harnesses. So we have a collective measure over individual measures. We can specify that in the in the in the design. Um, again, develop adequate prevention policy. I suppose I've just kind of really, I suppose I've just highlighted that there is documentation available, and we need to follow it. We don't need to shortcut it. It's not a box ticking. Excuse me. It's not a box ticking exercise. We need to commit to it. You know, the safety and health plan, the method statement, the risk assessments. They need to be signed off, committed to. If something isn't right, feed it back to the person who's preparing it. Um, and again, we have our permit to work and our, our rescue plan. Now, the rescue plan has to be in place under, I think, the 2001 regs. Um, if you are doing an entry, there has to be a rescue plan. As a designer, as a PSDP, if you cannot see your way to a rescue plan in the design you're auditing, in the design you're doing your designer's assessment of risk on, you have to go back, you have to look, you have to think how is someone injured in that space going to be rescued. And then, Give appropriate training and instruction to employees. Now, this is obviously a prerequisite with confined space entry. You don't just kind of send someone in, but if they have to do something serious, then we'll train them up. You train them up uh, to the absolute maximum. But the problem is it's right down here. Sending the most trained confined space entrant into a confined space is still the last thing we want to do. Okay, if it has to happen, we'll have the training. But it's right down there at the bottom. So if we can avoid it, we will. Um, or we will try. So look, as I said at the, at the start when we were setting the, the layout, we're going to try and go through these so they somehow align to the principles of prevention that we just went through. Um, not exactly, but it's just to kind of give some sort of structure. So with that, the first design consideration that we would ask is kind of the, the general, general arrangement and the access, the layout of the space. What's it going to look like inside? Um, if we're proposing considerations as designer, PSDP, um, we need to make sure that if, if we're proposing a confined space as a designer and as a PSDP, we need to make sure that those proposals are have been vetted, audited using the principles of prevention. If they haven't, if we've just gone straight to the confined space, then we're, we have to we have to really, I suppose, go back at it again. Um, this is a bit unclear, I'm afraid, so hopefully you can see what I'm saying here. Basically, consider the general arrangement. This is one of our pump stations in Cork City. And again, we'll talk about it later. These things are obviously um, kind of progressive. But entry here, down the ladder onto another platform, and down the ladder onto the base, potentially. Now, it's very unlikely the entrant is clipped on at all times. It's very unlikely they're on a, man, a rescue harness at all times. So you have to ask yourself, what's the gender? general arrangements doing to the entrance here. There's another small um, piece of writing here, aluminium supports, aluminium handrail. We'll just keep an eye on that because that comes up again later. But again, that kind of reliance on a material to maintain the general general arrangement of the space has to be based on the right assumptions for the of material for the environment. Um, that's a bit that's a bit kind of vague at the moment, but you'll see what I'm talking about in a few slides. Um, Obvious ones, just consider the access of the personnel who are going to use that space. Simple example here. This is a manhole access, I think maybe 650, 700 wide access. It's the only access into Manhattan North Pump Station. Um, so we have to go through it, but everything has to go through it. The jet vac hose, the jet vac jet, the rescue line, the air blowers. Um, probably the environmental gas monitor, everything's going through that, as well as the entrance. Um, whereas on this one, we have an entrance in full VA, clipped on to a man basket, going down through a hole, uh, a 
cover which is big enough to, to facilitate much safer entry, much safer and quicker extraction. So the rescue plan is much more straightforward. You don't leave the basket, and if you do leave the basket, you're still on a rescue harness, a rescue line. So um, again, just thinking about if we had this cover here, then um, again, the, the hazards would be somewhat mitigated. Um, just moving on, consider equipment access. Again, on the left, we have a screen which doesn't fit out through the hole for the screen. Uh, it's stuck. And on the right, we have had to cut away, not in my time, we have had to cut away one of the fall protection grids to get the pump out. The volute's too big for the hole. Now you can say, okay, look, that happens, but these are day one pieces of equipment. There's no reason these shouldn't fit out through the holes. Day one pieces of equipment. So again, we just have to think about it, um, and we need to revise the design if, when we get to the specification stage, things aren't working, things aren't fitting. Um, and again, just a quick one, consider site access. And you probably see that that's the outbound lane of the Lower Glenmire Road. Um, we have a pump station there. I don't know if any of you have jumped over it in, in recent times, but we can only do that work out of hours on a weekend, and we have to close a lane. So we need our suction tanker, we need our mechanical fitters to be on site in case there's an issue, we need traffic management. So it's a very challenging piece of work when the question is, did it have to be there? A few years later, they came along and built the road bridge over the railway line and reclaimed a little bit of the river. Could we have done that or could we have moved the pump station out? Could we have just thought a little bit outside, not so much the box, but outside of the road? Um, and again, so consider the access. How is that asset going to perform for the rest of its life? How are we going to maintain it? Um, and again, just a smaller issue here. Well, not a smaller issue, but a different issue. We've basically got to put the jet track on the footpath and we're sending pedestrians onto the road to go around it. There's a bit of space here. When we were building this, could we put a little set down area? Perhaps. Now, it's also something we could do now. We could adapt the place of work to technical progress. There probably were no jet tracks when. I think this is, well, I know this is in Sunday as well. There probably were no jet tracks. So, again, we could, we could uh, adapt or we could upgrade the place of work to, to accommodate that. Um, so, equipment and materials. I suppose with equipment, with materials, we're just always asking ourselves, or excuse me, with equipment, we're always asking ourselves, do we need it? Does it have to go in there? We have this conversation every day. Do we need mixers? Do we need screens, mulchers, pen stops, fixed gas, open grid flooring? Potentially any of those need an entry for a service. Now, okay, we can put them on uh, guide rails and we can lift them out. But do we need them? Do we need mixers, screens, mulchers, or could we just have better anti-clogging pumps? Just let, let, let all that debris onto the pump. Do we need fixed gas detection? Okay, look, fair enough, if, if it's in there, if it's talking to the air handling unit and it's, it's kind of controlling the, the environmental condition, okay, there's a reason for it. Then we're accepting that hazard and then we have to design it and manage it accordingly. But we have to just keep in mind, do we really need it? Or if it's just there to sense gas when we do an entry, we can use a personal monitor, we can use a portable environmental monitor. Um, and again, I suppose just what we were talking about earlier, consider the location. Is there direct access down onto that piece of equipment? Can we use a guide rail? Uh, can we take it out of the space and do the service on the, on the surface? Um, again, consider the equipment proposed. Is it appropriate for the, um, for, the, um, for the job that's being asked to do, for the task? Now, in the last 10 years, certainly in the wastewater industry, as you'd probably be aware, we've had a huge increase in the number of wipes which are being used. So screens are being absolutely overloaded. We have a fine bar screen here, struggling with wipes. We have a rotating bar interceptor screen there. Now, okay, there's a bit of a maintenance issue there. We'll hold our hands up to that. But it's still not appropriate to the application that's been asked to do. So we need to think, where is that, um, where is that piece of equipment going to end up? What's it going to end up doing? And is it going to stand the test of time? Consider material specification. These are images from a report which we've had done for, again, for Mahan North. Um, but they're basically just mild steel, 
no galvanized, no galvanized, just mild steel, uh, not mild steel um, bolts, and they're they're rotting away. They're, they don't have, they're not going to last very much longer. So again, I think at mild steel with no galvanizer in a kind of a damp environment, that was probably just an error in not an error, but that that was probably just poorly specified material. Whereas we need to consider the suitability of the material to its environment, even if we, I won't say think, but even if the intention is that it is specified correctly. Um, these first, second, and third pictures are all aluminium. That used to be a ladder. That used to be a handrail. And that used to be open grid flooring decking. Aluminium should have anti, good anti-corrosion resistance. It should form, I think, aluminium oxide, that kind of white coating, if you've ever seen it. And that should then protect the internals except if there are chlorides and sulfides. Now this is a city center pump station with tidal infiltration and a heavy fats, oil, grease effluent coming into it. So you have sulfides, you have chlorides. So when that aluminum oxide is, is forming uh, on the aluminum, the sulfides, chlorides are attacking it and then it's happening again and then it's eating away. So you can see what we're left with is material that wasn't appropriate for the environment. Now, the same material is in other pump stations built at the same time, and it's fine. But in these ones with tidal infiltration and a high sulfide content, it wasn't. And you can even see in those same pump stations, the ductile iron has been absolutely consumed by it as well. Um, and this is a, just a, an example. If you can see one, head, one hand wheel for a pen stop, two hand wheel, there is the first one, and there is the second one. That's open grid flooring, that's the handrail coming around there, and that's the handrail coming around there. So that pump station was built early 2000s. Um, you can see in 2005 it's starting to oxidize the aluminium, nothing strange there. But you can see by 2017, it's, we've opened the sump to respond to a pump trip actually. You can imagine why the pump has tripped, there's probably a bar in it. Um, and the whole thing is gone. The whole platform, everything is gone. Now, we don't do entry by 2017 into this pump station necessarily, as in we, would, we wouldn't go down the ladders. But there is a question, when between 2005 and 2017 did that become unsafe? And did we keep using it after that point? Now you can see here, the sewage gets quite high. If someone disappears through that decking into that sewage, that's a hugely, hugely, hugely hazardous situation. It's going to be sharp. They could be stuck, they could be snagged, or they could just be in it and not able to get back out. So, again, the material selection here has had a huge impact on the safety of the operative entering the confined space much later on in its design life, way after it's been designed or specified. Um, so, again, we have, to, we have to just think about how this material is going to interact with its environment. Um, and we'll ask questions later on about whether we need this. Should we specify it? Should we leave it out? Are we over-specifying the contents of the confined space? And again, not wastewater only, just any industry, just, just to ask that question. Um, and you can see, even if we had been replacing grid flooring and keeping that looking well, we say, okay, the grid flooring starting to rust, we'll replace it, we'll put in some GRP. The beam beneath it oops, is also broken. So you don't want it to look good. You don't want to replace the open grid flooring because that's going to hide the bigger risk underneath and the whole thing's going to go. So it's really, it's, it's a material issue in this pump station. Again, sorry for being so wastewater um, specific. but um, So again, just think about it. What's the implication? Day one to day, day 10 years, day 15 years. Um, and again, moving on from that because we touched on it just there with an operative potentially being at risk, the operation and maintenance. How is the space in your mind's eye going to operate? How are we going to interact with this space from a day to day? Um, again, you can see here, there's an actuator for a pen stop here, and there's a hand wheel here. That's the actuator, that's the hand wheel. We can't ask an operative to go down there and operate those things, obviously, nor should they, even if we did. But we could have just brought those spin balloons up to the surface. We could have gone to our principles of prevention. Um, we could have adapted the work to the individuals. Just rise, rise the spindle up to the surface. 
and operate to pen stocks from the surface, no entry. So again, it's just using our principles of prevention, thinking about how the space is going to operate, and we have we have an opportunity to, to mitigate out those kind of risks. Um, again, consider cleaning. So we're just going through the kind of the O and M uh, issues that we would face day to day with pump stations. But you can see here again another one of our pump stations. One, two, three. We have a crane driver, we have a top man, we have a suction tanker operator, all facilitating this guy's entry. And when he comes out, that's the environment he's been in. That's that's really not your best day's work ever. Um, well, it's probably the best a good day's work done, but I'm certainly, I'm sure he didn't enjoy it. And we have to ask, can we spare the operative these kind of experiences? Can, can we design the space so that cleaning and these kind of entries can be avoided? Um, in this pump station, this was actually done as part of the adapting the work to technical progress part, which is, you can see there's steel there, he's basically stripping out the entire remainder of the decking. We're just trying to bring it back to a concrete box with good access um, and good pumps, where we're trying to just really take it back and then see where we need to be after that. Um, I have a small video here, just in terms of maintenance and the ergonomics and the space within which the operator has to work. And in this one, you can see that he's um, he's actually cutting out the underside of all that decking, which has been collapsing in the previous slides. So I think. So again, just a really difficult place to do any sort of work. Um, now he's doing that work with a view to improving the space for the kind of for the future, but still just very difficult. So we, we just consider again what's the space going to be like after we're finished, or in a few years, you know, after the, after we've left after the design. Um, again, consider maintenance. How are you going to maintain these assets? These are two screens. Oops, sorry in two pump stations. On the left, he's doing an entry on a bolson chair. He can, he can access the screen fairly easily. On the right, the access is in a man basket and he's nearly down at the sewage level to, to get to it. The reason they're so low down is these screens are bolted on the underside of the screen. They're designed never to be taken out. Now, if they, even if a guide rail, a lifting chain, take away the bolt on the underside, even if they can be removed, pulled up to work on the surface, Regardless of the fact that they're, they're struggling with their application, at least you could service them. But these screens, you have to go face to face in the space to service them. And again, we're just thinking about when we design that bolt to hold that screen in, in place, what are we doing? What's the impact of that going to be? Um, again, just another consideration. Mahan North. Um, the pumps, the... The pump station is divided into a wet well, dividing wall, and a dry well. All fine there. Except the flow meter is about five or six meters off the ground. And again, like the pipe work in Sam's example, it's going to be very hard to do anything except service that electrically. If you need to remove it, your pipe work arrangement is going to be a big challenge. Um, and working in that space, trying to pull that out sideways and upwards. So again, what could we have done? Well, what we're planning to do, it's one of our our kind of upgrade pieces of work is to just move it outside the chamber, give it its own chamber, outside the pump station, shallow chamber, easy access on the horizontal, and much, much safer, no more need for a confined space entry. Um, obviously, consider the cost of the O&M works. We can see here again, for Mahan North, um, we have a tanker, one, two, three, four liner rod um, vehicles present to facilitate uh, a high risk entry. We also have the confined space entry, the breathing apparatus gear. This kind of work, I'm not sure about this one, but this kind of work with this kind of a work, um, um, an input can cost about 4,000 euros a day. And the work often isn't done in a day. 
So we're talking about a huge operational and maintenance cost. Whereas if, and we're going to get to it, I suppose I won't jump ahead, but Mahan North could be designed or we could retrofit to, to mitigate or to get rid of a lot of this stuff. Um, so consider the operatives. You can see here on the left, this is the kind of gear that the guys are putting on to enter these spaces. And just touching back on Sam's presentation or Sam's case study, we really want to ask an operative to do that. Are we comfortable when we put that down on paper that we're going to ask a guy to go down there and try and do work in that space? So we have to consider what and who we're asking to do something. So just a quick video, there's a few videos here just to show some of the, the environments that the lads are entering into. This just shows um, that small opening which has to be entered um, because there's no better access. And so what will follow on behind there is the jet track hose, the jetting hose, um, and potentially a second entrance as well. So there's another one there. So again, you can just see how deep down that is. I'm like, okay, there's there's the rescue harness, but I think the the cages, the man basket is down there as well. But not a nice place to be. And just one last one, just to really, I suppose the reason I'm showing you these videos is to reiterate that asking someone to enter is a hazardous. It's hard work. It's hazardous. So that decision to put a design together to ask someone to do something to enter a confined space. We have to take that very, very light. Uh, very, we don't take that lightly at all. Um, I have a note here, because it's worth reiterating, the confined space uh, 2001 rigs. They tell us that a person shall not enter a confined space to carry out work for any purpose unless it is not reasonably practical, practicable to achieve that purpose without such entry. In other words, if there's any other way to do the work, don't enter. That's pretty clear. So again, and just one other person in terms of the operatives, even if you're not asking someone to enter, there are other people impacted. So the top man here has got his head down a manhole for most of the day because the access and the visibility is so poor. Now his entrant is jetting. He's jetting sewage, he's jetting sludge. So that's creating a sewage aerosol. And he's exposed to that for the whole day. There's viruses, there's bacteria. So we have to consider what environment are we making for him? Like if we have big access here and he can step back and that can kind of happen around him and he can still see the entrance. It's a much safer situation. Now they're wearing masks, although that only looks like a dust mask. So I hope his is better. But again, it's another hazard that needs to be mitigated. And it's much less than ideal. Um, consider communication, again, because access is so poor in this pump station, this confined space, we need a second entrance to keep an eye on the first entrance. So now we have two people entering the space. And you can see here, it's kind of, these two slides are wrapped up together because they're the same space. We can see the first entrance is on the landing, looking down at the second entrance. So we have two people in the space. Now, that's one of Sam's guys, Eamon. Now, he's not a small guy. We, we'll get him out of there. We'll winch him out, but I hope he doesn't hit his head there on the way up. I definitely hope he doesn't get tangled up in that. And I hope I don't hit his head going out through the hole as well. Now, the way to avoid these entries, and something we're planning or hoping to, to put into a program for this year, is we can take off the roof slab, put a big cover in, cut out that platform, and then we have full access up and down. You can go down, you can go up. We might not even have to do an entry if we have full access to the space for the jet track. So again, we're adapting the work. We're adapting the place of work to technical progress. That's the plan, that's the intent. Remove that need for an entry. Take those two guys out of there, give them a cup of tea, tell them to just watch the jet track do its work. Um, 
Okay. So I think, look, I think I'm at the end of what I want to kind of just convey across in terms of our experiences in wastewater operations in Cork City. Um, since we've come in, these are the things we're kind of fixating on. These are the things we're trying to improve. And these are, this is the feedback from the maintenance, from the life of the asset, back to the designer to try and explain that, okay, it's hard, but we have to try and think. We basically have to try and think of everything. I know that's not possible, but we have to always push ourselves. So again, the summary being, understand your role in the design process, understand and know that what you do influences other people down the line, five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Identify and mitigate the hazards associated with O&M. I think we're very, very good on construction hazards uh, or constructability, but perhaps the O&M maybe gets overlooked, maybe not, but sometimes um, it needs to be maybe looked at again. And that's where I'm saying go to the industry, get that input from the people who are doing those pieces of work. Um, and again, as we said, consider all aspects of the space, the layout, the equipment, the materials, how it's going to function from day to day, and the operatives, the people going in there, walk through that space in their shoes. Um, and again, as we discussed with the environment's impact on the aluminium material, understand the unique characteristics of the space that's going to impact upon each aspect. And then as I keep reiterating, seek, seek input. Go to the expertise, go to the experience, go to the knowledge, and ask them what they think. Um, so I think, look, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for coming in on a Tuesday, um, and I'll leave it there. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. I just one question to kick off on yeah. the ground, I think. Um, just some of the examples there, let's say, with the tidal uh, ingress, um, would that have been something that was, um, I suppose, apparent at the design stage that that could be a possibility happening, or is that a consequence of maybe a defect elsewhere in the chamber that may not uh, be able to be considered at the design stage and would have a knock-on effect? Is there, is there a sequence of events there that a designer might need to, might need to I suppose, risk assess at design stage? Uh, no, it's, it's a very good question. It's, I, suppose, I suppose, speaking specifically about Cork City, uh, it does seem that the infiltration has increased over the years, whether there's been a collapse or a kind of a, an interconnection with an old culvert somewhere, it's hard to tell, but certainly these pump stations do seem to be receiving an increased tidal influence since they were first kind of um, constructed. And also, I suppose, the other way to look at it is they were conceived as part of the Cork main drainage, where it was anticipated that there would probably be full isolation of the foul network from the storm network and hence tidal infiltration. So there was probably, a, again, there was probably a valid assumption that these would be kind of watertight, self-contained networks. Um, but what we're seeing is as that asset ages and because the tidal water rises and falls within the soil beneath core, um, as the asset deteriorates or maybe just the gaps open, it's really starting to get in. So. I guess it's based on a reasonable assumption that it would be there would be no infiltration to the network, but I think the reality of the marshy land was that there was always going to be infiltration. So it's a hard one to say. I don't think at the time there's necessarily a challenge to the assumption, but looking down the line um, or looking back with hindsight, um, I suppose we could have gone belt and braces, we could have avoided it. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's probably a lessons learned, maybe. I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a lessons learned. Thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for similar kind of um, situations. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, just a question, I suppose, on the first design that you mentioned, um, where a building was built on top of an access code. How was planning? How do you get planning to build on top of an access code? Uh, or is it just something that is? It's a very, it's a good question. Uh, if that was one of our assets, you wouldn't get that permission. Um, it's a private asset. Um, Sam's asked me not to basically convey where or whose it is. Um, but the person developing the building is, is a private um, entity. So they have the full control over where they put their building. But you're 100% you're right if that came through. And someone wanted to put a building over any one of our assets, we'd be like, no, or you can give us a really, really, really good replacement. So, um, no, it's a good question. Um, 
and I think it's perhaps a sign of a lack of um, maintenance, knowledge and experience on that client's team that they allowed it to happen because they should be protecting their own interests a little better. That's a great question. Do you have very distinct uh, yeah. yeah, so as part of our confined space entry procedure, um, we obviously um, do our preliminary safety and health plan. We receive the method statement and risk assessment back from the contractor. We agree the date. Um, and before that date, what we do is we send the method statement, the risk assessment, the layout of the space, and a location map of the space to the chief fire officer. Um, usually Dave Spillett, I think he's assistant chief fire officer. And we get put on the watch list. Um, and then if there's an issue, we have on site, we have a kind of a cheat sheet for calling the emergency services to say, you know, we're here, we're at Matt North Pump Station, we're on your watch list, you have all the information, accesses through a manhole, the, the, the person is wearing a harness, there's probably a risk of gas. So we're tied up with the emergency services in that way. Um, and what, you, what we found is that when we do a new pump station, it's very possible you'll get the fire tender will call to site and they'll have a look, they'll, you know, they'll unload, they'll come in, they'll kind of look at what's going on because it's not a rescue they've done before. Um, so they want to get a feel for what's that environment they're going to have to go in. Now, I think there are issues, not issues, but it's, it's not clear whether the fire service would come and do an intervention as a rescue or as a recovery. That's not clear. It's whether they, you know, if, if there's an issue, whether they'll dive straight in as if it were a fire or whether they'll stand back and they'll kind of have to do their own checks and balances first. That, that hasn't been challenged. In, or not challenged, but tested in reality. So what we'd like to do with the, the fire services, maybe arrange a kind of a trial run out in the, the regional training center and kind of say, look, man down, there's gas, he's on a harness, and see, if, see how they would affect a rescue. And we haven't done that yet. But certainly, yeah, they, they are, we're on their watch list and, and they do, uh, they do watch us, basically. Yeah, yeah just quick on that, uh, so you showed quite a lot of organizations how it could have been designed with a better and a lot of material choices, which you know, kind of disintegrated over time. Have those lessons learned been absorbed into how we are building and designing organizations? Today, so standard material choices we're doing today won't hold up. Or are we still doing the same things, and it's guys around that are constantly having problems, but it's not reaching the design out. It's a good question. It's a very good question, actually. Um, for me, on the operation on the maintenance side now, it's hard to know. Um, secondly, these lessons are kind of only being learned now or in the last five years. Um, and thirdly. Sorry, this isn't a very good answer. But thirdly, there aren't that many of this size pump station being designed every day, if you know what I mean. Um, these are big pump stations. So I suppose speaking about our own lessons learned, we've retrofitted two of those pump stations that you saw. You know the one where the pipe was dragged out and it was basically not pipe anymore? Um, that's all being retrofitted with stainless steel, marine gray stainless steel. Um, everything, the guide rails are stainless. The pipes are stainless. Um, the only thing that isn't stainless is the pump um, pedestal, but that's got several extra layers of zinc coating on it. So we're trying to learn the lesson. And someone asked me, actually, when we were doing that last year, I think actually, I can't remember who it was, but it was, um, well, let's see if that basically stands the test of time for 15 years. In other words, are these pump stations going to eat marine grade stainless steel? I hope not. I hope these, these are the last risers we put into it. So yeah, from our point of view, we're learning those lessons. And I guess a forum like this is us trying to kind of push those lessons back out there. And again, it's not to say aluminium is wrong. It's just to say, is it right for the environment? Um, and certainly for those two, we did big, deep retrofits on both the foul and the storm sump. I think it was, you know, four foul risers in each, two storm risers in each, and all that went with it. I mean, like, these were huge. Well, not huge. These were good-sized pump stations. You know, we're talking 300, 400 discharge risers, good size, um, and all that went with it. We had, I think, 
six or seven contractors, and I know Rob was there for a good shot of it as well. His lads were down the valve chamber breaking out the old thrust blocks, but we had, you know, lee side cutting core, pouring the walls. We had Wexford Piping doing the fabrication. We had Xylem doing all the retrofit. We had a plant hire guy operating the crane. We were up and down to site tech in Little Island. It took, at one stage, there's six contractors on site in a hoarded off area by the monument in Grand Parade, all on site at the same time. It's a really tricky, tricky piece of work to retrofit these spaces. And I think that is applicable to any industry, that if you have to retrofit that space, if you have to rebuild it from scratch, it's really hard to do it, especially when you need to keep the flows live. Um, like you can't just get rid of the sewage, you can't just ask it to wait two weeks. It's a real tricky piece of work. And I'm sure there are lessons there that we would probably justify another kind of case study here just to look at Grand Parade and Coldplay, which are those two pump stations. So, so yeah, hopefully we are learning the lessons um, and hopefully this kind of helps maybe those lessons to get out into the industry. Any final questions before we uh, close the proceedings? No? Just hand over to yeah, I suppose uh, just on behalf of um, the committee, uh, Jersey Ireland, the attendees tonight and those at home, uh, just like to offer a vote of thanks to Simon um, and also to, to Sam. I know he couldn't be here, but I know he put a lot of effort into yeah. the, the slides. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I suppose I spent most of my career in, in kind of motor roads and transport, but I think this isn't just about confined spaces. Um, it's a broader health and safety issue that everybody in design um, and site engineers like myself in, in the capital side of thing, things need to take into consideration. Um, we have obviously a legal obligation under the various acts. We have a moral obligation to those working with us. Nobody wants to be present on a site where there's an accident or, God forbid, a fatality. Um, and finally, I suppose, Bring it down to brass tax. It brings me, it reminds me also of lectures that we've done on facilities management and asset management, in that there's massive costs involved in doing this kind of troublesome maintenance and um, that could be avoided by spending that little bit more money, a little bit more time at the capital stage. But the overall benefit to the organization. Um, be, it, be it a local authority in the case of, of, of wastewater or Irish water as it is now, um, be it a farm or a company, um, ultimately there is great benefit to be had there in terms of, 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 of litigation, in terms of health and safety, in terms of costs. Um, so I hope you've all gained benefit of it as much as I have um, and I'd like to offer uh, Simon a uh, usual vote. Thanks for being here.